Okay, let's get started. This is the computer graphics class, and today we're going to start the first tutorial on creating VRML objects. So what you're going to want is uh, a VRML viewer or a browser plugin, which you probably should have already installed on your computer. And uh, actually, this is the attendant, so I forgot to give it to you. I'll give it, leave it with you. Um, and the tutorial that we're going to go over is in fall 2012 and if you look under computer graphics and you look under well let's see uh, this link right here where it says VRML, VRML examples uh, what we have going on here let me make sure I've got my volume turned up here as well uh, what we have now is uh, this tutorial here's a PowerPoint that I'm going to go over and then we have example one two three four five six this is what we're doing today so we'll look at texture mapping, we'll look at building shapes, and we'll look at how are you supposed to put this stuff together to create your first assignment, which is the robot. So hopefully you'll be able to, at least at this point, by the end of today, start creating some shapes and some objects and start doing some stuff. Uh, and you certainly should be able to do the first assignment at the end of today. Um, so I've downloaded this and I'm going to do it on a Windows partition because a lot of people are using Windows. Um, and so good. Actually, now it looks like today I have three people and four people on MacBooks, so... Well, it works either way. <laughs> Usually I have more Windows people, so... I've got a Windows partition open on my MacBook. It's using Parallels Desktop, uh, so this works anyway. This is the uh, VRLMN tutorial number one, which is the link that I quickly looked at here and just to reiterate the point. This is the link here. If you click on it, you can download the PowerPoints, because you want to actually do it because you'll be able to cut and paste and um, use the examples. In fact, here if you just click on the examples, depending upon whether or not you have the browser installed, it might open up. I don't have the browser plugin installed on my Mac side, so mine just opens up and I can download a WRL file. So all of the VRML, Virtual Reality Modeling Language files, have a WRL for world, is what that stands for, file extension on them. So we're creating worlds. And now what I'm going to do is go through step by step, and then we'll create some shape, some shapes, and we'll put the shapes together, do tr some transforms on the shape, and apply some coloring and some texture mapping. And so these are the ones that we're going to be going through. You want to download this one here as the image because it's going to be the image that we're going to put on the texture mapping as well. So if you're bored, you can go through and download all of this stuff right here. And what I'll end up doing is probably putting it in a subdirectory for next week's examples as we continue through this. But um, all right, so I'm going to leave this kind of PowerPoint-ish up like this. Well, actually, here, I'll make it bigger, and then I can switch back and forth. So we've already figured out what VRML is in terms of its concept. So today we're going to build some stuff, and the source code examples are going to be um, in this tutorial work. And to take a, a look at, in particular, the concept, what we have here is the file structure. So I'm going to kind of demonstrate what you can do. In fact, I'm going to click on my PowerPoint here. Oops. Well, there we go. You click on the right file, and I'm going to copy it. And I'm going to open up a notepad file. And I'm going to paste it in here. There we go. It's actually a little bit bigger, so I can go over it a little bit easier. Um, what we have in the PowerPoint over here, and make that look good again. There we go. Is that the start? It starts with a special character at the top. This is hash sign of this dollar. Uh, excuse me, a pound sign, and it says VRML version 2.0. Just tell us the browser plugin what version. We're only up to 2.0, but we might end up with 3.0 soon. But in any case, it's basically just telling the browser to use this plugin when we click on the file. It gives the version number and the character code, and it's UTF for standard text format. So in the example here, and if you do this, the only thing you really have to pay attention to is to make sure that you don't get any special characters. And that you're, in fact, what I just did here is change the quotation mark so it looks like this. You notice this quotation mark over here? Um, it's like, it's a slightly different font. So that's a text font. 
So make sure you're saving it in a text file. Make sure your quotation marks are looking okay. And now uh, what we've got on the top is world information. So this is other information that's going to be sent to the browser. Because we're going to save the file. In fact, I'll save it right now. And I'll save it as test. Uh, let's see, test dot, and then you want to say change the text type if you're doing it this way to uh, all types. I'm going to call this a lecture dash test, so I know which one it is. Dot wrl for world, and in here I've defined a shape. I've used a definition here. I don't actually have to use a definition. I can just call it shape if I want to. Um, or I can put in the definition for it. And if I define it, in this particular case I've defined it fbox, then I can refer to fbox um, at other places in my code. Um, in fact, we'll see that coming up in an example. So we give it, uh, we give the version number, we give the character coding up here. This is what this is talking about. This has to be the first line of the, of the file. Because when we click on the file, and I'll show you what happens, I'm going to save it. Then I'm going to look for it on my desktop where I saved it. Um, where did I save it? Let's just do a save as. I'm sorry? Yeah, it's in my documents or something. I'll put it on the desk. I don't know if I saved it over here. Hmm. Maybe I saved it in my documents or something. No, it's in here, huh? Oh, here it is up on the top. I'm sorry. Here it is right here. <laughs> If I double click on the file, it brings it up in the Cosmo browser and my plugin on Internet Explorer. Here's my Internet Explorer coming up. And my browser is probably going to give me a warning message because I'm loading a, a file. Yeah, here we go. So, so protect the security, Internet Explorer has restricted the web page running a script, yada yada. So I'm going to say allow blocked content. And I'm going to say yes, I probably should just turn that feature off or set a different default browser. And then here's the shape that I've defined. So if I click on the browser here, I can see I've got a white box. This is like the hello world, so you might want to try this right now if you've got the ability to do it. If you're on a window, if you're on a Mac system, let's do it on a Mac real quick here. I've opened up Text Wrangler. Unless my computer's gonna die. It's actually kind of acting kind of slow right now. And I'm pasting it into my text wrangler. And uh, I'm going to make sure that these uh, quotation marks are correct again. Otherwise, I'm going to get some bad characters that are going to come up. And uh, let's see what's going to happen here. There we go. And I'm going to save it. I'll do a save as. I'll put it on the desktop. And I'll save it as test one dot brml brml. There we go. Or actually, just call it wrl. There we go. Wrl. If I save it as a file type wrl, it automatically gets picked up by the wrml browser uh, as as a plugin. Or in this particular case, it's not being picked up at all. So let's shut this window here. I can right mouse click and open with, and then select, and I've downloaded a couple weeks ago this this plugin called uh, it's actually a viewer called instant player so I'm gonna bring it up in instant player right now and uh, momentarily we're gonna see the image appear and it'll look just the same as it did in my browser window so here it is in the instant player if you don't have these plugins so this Cosmo plugin then it means you need to go back and take a look at the video from a couple weeks ago I'm not gonna go through that all over again and uh, also, we downloaded this a couple weeks ago for the Mac people. In fact, it was like maybe last week or the week before we downloaded the Instant Reality um, Player. So you can kind of see I've got it over here on the Mac side. And you see where it says up on the top of the window, it says this is an example. That text is actually coming from up here where it says this is an example. It's the title. And the information that's coming out of it, if I look at Instant Player, and if I go into like the properties or I look at the file in terms of some of the browser support and some of the plugins, it would actually tell me this information, copyright 2012, someone special, or whoever it happens to be who wrote the thing. So this is the title that shows up in here. However, you don't see the title over here. I don't see this as an example anywhere over here. 
although I had the same plugin coming out of it. So it depends upon what your browser is doing, what kind of browser you have, as to what the, how that information is going to be used. Also, as an alternative, you can leave this out. So I'm going to take and remove the world information out of here, and I'm going to save it. Save, and then I'm going to open it up one more time. Now it just says test1.wrl on the top, and I've got my same box. I'm also going to show you something else as well. If I go in and edit the file, I believe I still have, no, I don't have the file open anymore. If I go in and open it with a text edit here, text wrangler, actually I'll just do it with text wrangler. And then uh, if I take this out here and just do shape, take out the definition, oops, don't do that, edit undo. There we go. Leave that in there, but just take out the definition and just leave it as shape. And then I can change them at, well, actually, I don't have anything specified here. I'm just calling this shape. Here's a geometric box. I could say square and then save it. And then double click, uh, click on it to open it up to run it again. And I go, well, what happened? There's no such thing as a square. <laughs> so I'd have to actually pick a defined shape. So if I put back in here and go, okay, let's just put box in here. And then save it. And then come back over here if I'm clicking on the correct file and then open it up. And look at it in the instant player. Lo and behold, I have my box back. So if you make a mistake, it's sort of like HTML as you just seen a few minutes ago. Nothing happens. So if it doesn't appear on the screen, it means that it doesn't know about square, it doesn't know about sphere, or one of the properties that you've set for the device doesn't make any sense. So it's not only going to generate any error messages for you. Some plugins will. As an example, if I come back to Windows here, close this guy out, and uh, let's change box to uh, paper. I know there's no such thing as paper. <laughs> and I select to save. And I double click on this one again to load it up. In a moment now. Here we go. Now the, the this plugin is going to actually show me something interesting. And I'm doing this on purpose to kind of show you what's going to happen. So allow the block content, which I probably should just disable. I put paper in there as the property, and there's no such thing as paper. So now I have those little red indicators down here. It says, uh-oh, there's a problem. So if I click on the little red indicator in my little screen here, I make it a little bit bigger so you can see it. It's going to say, parsing error, paper in line 13, node not found. There's no such thing as paper. <laughs> so you can actually make this bigger here, or you can duplicate it yourself, actually. So it's kind of going to, the Cosmo player is going to give me a little bit of feedback. So what you're looking for to see if there is feedback is whether or not you've got red right here on the bottom and also a blank screen which is going to give that to you. Alright, so let's assume that we want to create correct code as we go through this and so if I look forward on this here we go. I have defined that uh, an, an F box which is going to be called a forward facing box because I haven't done any translation on it yet so here's the object. So the world information is the title, can be rendered by the VRML viewers, but it's sort of an optional thing. Not all viewers actually work with it. Hopefully the viewer is going to render the image for you, um, which is what we're looking for. But the text may, not, may or may not necessarily be rendered. Uh, although we did see that the title showed up in the title box. So now we have the object. And this, this world only has one object in it, and the object, and here's the contents of the world, is going to be this F box shape. And it is a shape. So what you're doing is you're just defining a bunch of shapes. One shape after another shape, and we're going to see examples with multiple shapes in them, so you can sort of see how this works. And you're giving off appearance and material, which we haven't really set, but these are subparts. So think of them sort of like functions, but they're really properties that look like methods, actually. So if you're familiar with object orientation, this is totally confusing. If you're not, this is very straightforward because you're creating a shape 
and inside of the tape you have an appearance, and inside of the appearance you have a material, and then you have a geometric box is the geometry for it. So it's uh, you, you sort of have to get used to it. And here, here, here's the kind of the hierarchy to it all. So we have the shape node. So we're actually creating a node that we're using, and the appearance is the appearance. The ge geometry field down here is going to specify well, what kind of shape is this? So the shape node is a data structure that contains two fields of describing an object. Causes a shape to be rendered in terms of the concept. So all we're doing is starting out with nodes. So we're building a sort of like a tree or a hierarchy. The world information at the front. World info is not part of the hierarchy. It's the information about the world in terms of its description. So we can give objects name, and as I mentioned before, that's what we did with define f box or forward facing box, um, which is going to be the shape. So in terms of that, the shape object now has a name, so we can refer to it as f box. So it's a definition of a shape with a name, and VRML is case sensitive. So because we used capital letters here. Most people would actually just go with all upper or all lower and then be consistent with each one of your examples. That way you can essentially um, you know, be able to remember without having to know what case it's supposed to be in. But, um, so here's an appearance with some materials and we're going to do a, a geometry box in this particular case. So then we have the concept of transformations. And when before I described what a transformation is, let's refresh our memories on this box here. When I opened it up, it was in a default position that was aligned on the z-axis at zero with x and y right in the center. So if I open it up again, and I just want to show you, it looks flat. It originally comes out in a two-dimensional. A transformation is going to do this for us. It's going to move it in the plane, transform it to a different starting position, and then also in a different, we can set the position, we can make it so it's not movable or we can animate it and move it on its own. So the transformation is just basically the one going from here, if I can get this back correctly, which I probably couldn't, which is why I closed it and opened it back up again, to here, or to another. So let's take a look at the transformation. So the transformation is moving an object to a new XYZ coordinate. So in VRML, the center of the object is moved by adding XYZ changes. So we have what's called rotation and scaling. So rotation, we rotate the object along one or more of the XYZ coordinates in an amount of the radian, so an angle essentially. Or so to rotate is to move along the XYZ coordinates, to scale is to alter the size of an object in one of the three possible ways. We can alter it along the X or the Y or the Z coordinate system. We'll see some examples of this coming up in a few minutes. So in VRML, scaling is applied by giving three scale factors. So we have the scale for X, the scale for Y, the scale for Z. So we can kind of change the shape appearances by playing around with the X, Y, Z. As an example, a 2, 2, 2 will double the size of the object, whereas a 1, 2, 3 We'll leave the x and the y, the x, the x coordinate is 1, it's going to be unchanged. Double the size of the um, object along the y axis, which is 2. And then triple the size of the object along the z axis, which is the 3 that was put in there. Uh, so let's see if I can get to And we're looking at this, x, y, z. So when it comes up, essentially we're zeroed on the z, so we're facing forward which is how we're transforming it. So I'm going to cut and paste this guy here. Copy. And uh, this guy is a transform and it's going to use the F box, which is why we defined the F box. So if I come out of here, and I still got this one saved, let's see what I got out here. Open with Text Wrangler. Nope, I took the F box out. Okay, maybe I have it over here. I believe this font is a little bit bigger here, too. Yep, I have a F box. So on the bottom here, underneath all of the, because this is one complete unit, this is a node. And then I'm going to come down here, 
and I'm going to paste this in here. It's going to say transform as a child use F box. And if I save it, and I double click here, and hopefully it opens, which it's going to do. I just have a lot of stuff running on this computer right now. <laughs> and I'm going to load the content. This is probably good because it slows it down, slows me down a little bit. And I go, oh, look, there's an error message. You want to see error message? Say, paper. Oh, okay, so I still have that error I introduced. Okay, hold on one second. <laughs> Let me fix this paper and put a box in here. <laughs> I forgot I introduced an error in this example. All right, so now I'm going to run it. I'm going to see what's going to happen now. Allow blocked content, yes. I'm going to set my default browser differently next time I do this. Well, this is an interesting. I'm going to put this on a... So this wheel over here is going to change the to a rotation. Now I'm going to rotate it. And I have a different shaped box that's underneath the first box. So I have two boxes right now that are showing on the screen. The first one was this one we came out with originally. That's node number one. Right up here, we have the first node that was defined by fbox. And then under here, we're going to use fbox as a child node. And the child node is going to scale it. And so we've scaled, we've rotated, and we've translated. So we've done all three with this. You're wondering, what does that mean? Well, let's play around with the scale. The scale means we made it bigger. <laughs> the one on the bottom, the length and the width are slightly bigger if we take a look at it. And we've also rotated it because you see how this square front's here and the square front's over here. So we've rotated the bottom. We've got them one on top of the other because we've put them in the position of the nodes one on top of the other. So it happened for us automatically, but we've also translated it. And here's our translation here. So we've moved it instead of putting. So if I take the translation out, let's just take the translation out. And we go save. We pick this down here. And we double click here. And we open it up here. And we wait because this is running on a snail space. I probably could use it on the Mac side a little bit faster, I believe. Now they're on top of each other. <laughs> they're overlapping. <laughs> because we translated it, and if I come back over here, and I go undo, and I say, well, what did I take out? The translation. So the translation moves it. So as I was mentioning last week, you can create a UFO by creating a bunch of different shapes. Putting them all out there, create the nodes. If you don't translate it, it's all going to appear on top of each other. You don't have to call it this way either. In fact, I could just, instead of having using this child node as a box, it enables me not to have to redefine a shape as a box. This could have different property to, properties to it color and shading and stuff, and I can just reuse that concept because it says use F box. It's using this box that I defined up here, which is the reason why I've defined it. And so now I have them overlapping. Well, actually, you can see, because one of them is a slightly different shape than the other one, there are, you know, you can see one of them is inside of the other one. And then none of them are translated. So if I translate it, I can move it. And when I've moved it, this is the X, this is the Y, this is the Z. So I've moved it down on the Y, or excuse me, up on the Y, um, which is essentially the reason how you're going to figure this out is going to play with the numbers. The rotation, so the scale I made it bigger, I can make it even bigger here. In fact, so if I make it like this, I can make it so it's uneven, so I have 5.5 and two on here. Let's see what happens when I do that. So what you're going to do is play around with this. Yeah? No, it's a new one. 
because I've created a new node, and the new node is going to be a transform. And it's a different kind of node. It's ah, it wasn't. It was by the default. So now um, what I've done here is I've changed one of the sides to 5, so now it really looks big. <laughs> so now it's like, I think it was 2, I changed it on the 5, so it's not, it's like not really a, a box anymore, it's more of a rectangle. If you don't mention any dimensions at all, in fact if we go back to the beginning we just said box, it's just going to give you standard box whatever default settings are there, which is probably going to be like a 1x1x1 one by one by one or 2x2x2, two two two. and these are in pixels, but they're, it's also interpreted by the browser and by the plugin that you're using. So if I put this back, let's scale it back to 2, let's put it on 1 now, I'm going to rotate it slightly differently, I'm going to rotate it to a 1.5 here, and a, a 1 over here, and I'm going to see what happens. And then if I, uh, I think I saved it, I hope. Yeah, pretty sure I did. I put the rotation, I think I put the translation back, which is why it's now underneath as well. Because remember, I, I did an undo and I took this and I put this back in. So we have one box on top of the other one now. Here we go. So I've rotated it oddly. So, if I look at the side view, now I have the one box underneath it rotated. It's actually cutting off the corner of the first box because it's overlapping in the coordinates. But I've got an interesting effect going on here. So your UFO can look like anything. It's a UFO. It's an unidentified flying object. You know, it, you can put different shapes on here as an example. In fact, I have to use this as a cheat sheet because I don't have all the shapes memorized. But if I go skip ahead a little bit to the different shapes, um, let's see. We're gonna we're gonna come back. Don't worry. Uh, here's some. How about a cylinder, or a sphere, and a cone? So I'm gonna play around with this for a second. I'm gonna come back over here, and I'm gonna go. Actually, I'm not even going to do that. I'm just going to, well, I'm going to cut and paste this here. and Let's put it underneath. I'm building a UFO, by the way, so I'm going to go, let's call this one a cone. So this is just going to be a cone. And I think I've capitalized this C here, hopefully. There we go. I'm going to take out this, well, I'm going to call this one uh, um, C, <coughs> C, C. CC ox. I don't know, it doesn't make any sense, but let's just call it something. Uh, just to keep the definition, just in case I want to reuse the shape again. I don't have to, and I can transform the shape. I don't actually have to redefine the shape. So if I save this sucker here, I just got hit with a bug. <laughs> and then uh, load her back up again. I'm not quite sure why I'm running out of snail space here. Could be that I have a virtual box opened up and I need to allocate more memory to it. Quite possible. Uh, so let's say I'm going to allow the contents. I'm going to see, it look, see what it looks like here. I'm going to go, well, where's the cone? There is no cone in here. Which is interesting. Okay, so then I have to go, well, what happened here? Maybe I'm not clicking on the right one. or Maybe I didn't save it. So here's the test. Um, oh, it's probably inside of everything. <laughs> so then I'm going to apply a transform to it. Because it could be that the shape is behind. And the cone is probably behind the box. Because the box was out there. So I'm going to transform now. I'm going to put the... Oops. I'm going to put the cone out here. I'm going to use the... I'm going to put another one out here. So I could just define it in here on the transform. I don't have to do it this way. I'm doing it this way because I've defined it out here. I can just put the shape in here and not use the child shape as a child. Um, so let's see. And then uh, let's see. So I'm going to take out this transform up here to see if I can get one underneath it. So now I have two shapes, and now I've decided I'm going to create a transform for that one. So I'm going to save it. 
Let's see if it works. May not. Who knows? So it's kind of a trial and error, uh, which is why you want to make sure you have a browser or plugin installed or a viewer so you can go through this process. There are some programs that will help you with the dimensions to figure out, well, where is the stuff? And then you'll go, well, let's see. I've got a cone that was an interesting transform, actually. The shape now looks, oops, I spun it uncontrollably. It sort of looks like a speaker. Kinda. Sorta. I don't know. I could rotate this a little bit this way, maybe. So I've, I've kind of built one shape and I've attached it to the other by transforming it down. So, which is kind of an interesting concept. I could stick the shape inside of here as well without using the, the definition as well. So, just as a side comment. Alright, so let's go back to the lecture and see what else we can do. So this is how you're going to build your UFO, by the way. So a little thing about the transform. Here's the transform node. It's called a transform because we're taking the base image and we're transforming it. We don't have to take one that's created. We can define our own. The scale here is the x is to the y is 0.5 and the z is to These can be negative numbers if you are rotating it around the negative axis, moving it around so you're seeing the back side instead of the front side, um, if, if that's the case. Rotating it here, we're rotating by 0.78 radians, or 45 degrees is our rotation in this guy right here, along the y-coordinates. Uh, because we have 1, 2, 3, x, y, z. Uh, no, actually... Mm, the degree is going to be on the y coordinate. And then here we have xyz on here for the translation. You don't change the x coordinate, subtract 0.5 from the y, and don't change the z. And then you've translated it from the one position to another by moving it down in this particular case. So, transform node of the data structure, given, uh, giving rotations, translations, and scale of the object, the operations carried out, a separate are a sequence given. You don't have to use all three. You can use one or the other or just one. And they're given in terms of a top to bottom. So it starts at the top and then does it in that particular order. Transforms within a transform apply to the child of the node. So you can put a bunch of nodes together and transform them together and cause the transform shape to be rendered in the concept. So here we're going to add the second. This is what we did, actually. I just kind of cut and pasted it and moved ahead. So in example number two, what we just looked at a few minutes ago, transform adds a second object to our environment and places it below the first one, applies the given changes to the second object, and here's the transform node. So now we have two objects. So you can possibly imagine we can add more objects to this as long as we're placing them in positions that we're going to be able to see, as I saw before with the cone that I just did a few minutes ago. So now we have the appearance. So what we've started with here is the definition of the shape. We've looked at the, the definition as well as the transform. Now we have this appearance appearance. So it can contain a material node and a texture node. So the material node can contain six different fields to it. And uh, what are we looking at? Diffuse color, specular color, emissions color. Uh, I'm trying to make this a little bit bigger so you can see it. I just realized it's kind of small. Actually, I got a better idea. We'll bring it up this way, see if this helps at all. So we've got the world node here. And I got the objects. Here's our transforms, our rotation, our scaling coordinate system transforms here. So we're right here on the appearance nodes. So it contains a material node or a texture node. So we have diffuse color, specular color, emissive color, ambient intensity. Well, this is going to be adding color, shininess, transparency. So we can change the appearance. And these are some of the parameters that we can change. And not all of them. This is why I gave you all those links to all those different tutorials, because you'll find um, different tutorials that will focus on color focus on translations. And there's some tools out there that you can use to translate stuff. So I'm actually going to leave this up over here and uh, take a look at my test one over here. Let's just see if the test one actually works. Uh, okay, so it should. We have shape and uh, in the shape here we have the appearance. 
and the parents we have a material item and in the material item we're going to call it a missive color zero zero point eight and then zero and then we're going to do transparency it's going to make it a little lighter so we can see through it so i'm going to point five instead of a one transparency which would be no transparency and do solid shape so transparency zero point five and now i'm making sure hopefully that I've typed everything correctly and I'm going to save this guy I'll just kind of leave him up here and then uh, I'll just try this technique played in the instant player just to be fair so here's the original one that I had up a few minutes ago and here's the new one that I just created now if I move it around I say oh look at that I got a little diffuse, so I got, so you see how the color, I don't know if you can see that, you can't see that actually. Well, you can sort of see a little bit. So the transparency is kind of, you can some, almost see through this little, this face of the block. If you load this on your computer, you can actually see it a little bit better than that projector there. But uh, it's a little bit see-through. It's trans, it's a 0.5 on the transparency. So if we made us adjusted this a little bit more, and this is the reason why I like this particular browser is I can kind of tell the differences here. So I'm going to go like this. I'm going to go. Let's make it negative two. I don't know what that's going to do. Seriously, uh, probably give me an error message. I don't know. Let's see. Maybe I should have gotten 0.25. No. Let's see what happens with that. It's probably going to come out black. No, comes out lighter. Oh, so now maybe you can see the contrast a little bit more. Now I can sort of see it on the screen a little bit. It's a little bit more transparent, which means the face of it here. The facing of there we go, it's kind of white now. Oh, there you can see it. You can see this back part over here. It's changing in color. And so we've got this green color that's coming out of the emissive color on an RGB scale, red, blue, and green. So we've lowered the blue and the green comes out of blue and yellow so if I'm going to close some of these suckers here I'm going to play around with the color for a minute so if I take a look at the color here and let's take this one add some red to it so well, let's take away some red actually because we took away some some blue red blue uh, so go, I'm going to go like 0.5 red blue red green I'm sorry green RGB red green no RG green B blue <laughs> RGB colors okay so don't quote me on that <laughs> okay so let's see mm, I've added a little bit more red to it so and I actually can see the you can see the transparency a little bit more so I'm gonna, Make the transparency minus 10. I'm going to add 2 to the red. I really want this a little bit more red. So I'm going to go like that with it. I'm not getting so far, but my transparency is getting lighter. But, uh, I'm going more yellow now. So anyway, you're going to go online and look up the colors, essentially. Actually, let me just try one more here. Let's go. Let's take this away. Go on. Let's see what happens with this. Ah, oh, now I'm in the pinky tones. So I got uh, some purple going on here, <laughs> but you can see my uh, my transparency a little bit better on here. So anyway, if I made this positive, it's just going to get darker. Yeah, it's like black now. <laughs> it's on there, but you can't see it because it matches the background. <laughs> it's completely solid. So let's make this negative. Negative 90. Okay. 
Well, hopefully you get an imagination of uh, what, what could possibly be so difficult in trying to figure out well, what combination do I have. Then you go online you go, what's the RGB color I want? And in fact, this is a classic example. You bring up a web browser and you go uh, to Google. And you type in RGB colors. We don't want the hex, we just want the numbering system. So here's something here, this looks pretty good, the mapping. So we have uh, 192, 192, and 192 is gray silver. 10, 10, 10 is another form of a gray. Let's take a look here. Tons of grays in here. Uh, aqua blue. Let's see if that works actually. Poppy. Well, I didn't specify the color. I don't see missing colors. Just do it this way. Oops. Nope, didn't like that combination. Uh, what did I, actually, it is the combination. Here it is right here. <laughs> Wait a minute, let me pick another combination. Let's pick this one underneath it here. Uh, yeah, I got exactly what I asked for. Uh, let's see. Let's try this one out. This one should be a purple color. With instant player, nope. All right, so it's a scale is slightly different than this scale here. This is probably oh, this is a decimal conversion, so you'd have to do it in a number. So it's probably better in this particular case to go online and look for the VRL mail colors. So then I would, you know, take okay. So if I wanted to really automate this, I'd go like here: VRML RGB colors. Mm -hmm. And then we have black. Okay, so we have the red, the green, and the blue combinations. Silver, lime. So let's say if I want maroon, I'd go 0 0.500. So let's try that one out here. What did it say? 0 0.500. <laughs> but this is also a miss of color, so let's see. Um, we have some examples with some different types of colors as well, so let's see. What's color? Is this maroon? It's maroonish. Yeah, so that's a little bit closer in terms of color. Also, you might your monitor itself. In fact, this looks a little different than it does on mine. This looks like more. Not as maroony as it does on my screen, actually. So the projector is actually changing the color of it a little bit. So. This, by the way, I just did a simple Google search on it. And usually they're going to show you the colors, and then they're going to show you, essentially, the scale. So this is how you're going to look up the information, by the way. Nobody memorizes the RGB scale and the numbers combinations to give you the colors that you want. So I'm going to leave this window up, actually, because I might refer back to it later for some other colors. Uh, so let's see. If I go back to the PowerPoint, <laughs> what we're looking at here is an emissive color. So the transparency of 1 means invisible, 0 means transparency is the default. So you leave the default transparency in existence. And 1 means that it's invisible. So if I set the transparency to 1, it's not going to be, in fact, that's what I did. I set it higher than 1, made it invisible, actually, so I couldn't see it. Um, why would you want to do that? Because then you can change it further down the road and make it, uh, make it visible and then the object would appear out of nowhere, essentially. So texture modes. So we have image textures. So we can cover an object with, with a uh, still image specified by a JPEG or a PNG file. We have movie textures. We can actually put links in there, too. I have an example that's going to show you a hyperlink as well. Texture maps with a PNG file onto an object. Or pixel texture. And um, just to show you uh, what we did with the 
Um, color, before I forget, we looked at emissive color, so the object glows. Just to kind of fill you in on what we did here. The object glows with the light as its own, uh, with its own color. It doesn't cast light on other objects, the emissive color category that we set. If we wanted to change a specular color, I mean the color highlights on shiny objects, or ambient intens intensity that can be set, or shininess, how reflective the object is. So shininess number between 0 and 1. Um, 1 meaning it's off between 0, so 0.5 to turn it on. So if I wanted to, I can add shininess. And here, let me do this as an example. Um, although, let's, um, here it is right here. I'm going to change the uh, color to a diffuse color, so which is a normal color. So here where it says emissive color, maybe I can change this view as well. View the text display. Show the fonts here. Let me make this a little bit bigger so you can see what I'm typing, actually. Uh, to 18. Oh, there we go. That's a little bit better. Let's see, 2018, 24, 36. Ah, perfect. Perfect. Now you guys can actually see what I'm typing. <laughs> so, I had it on emissive color. Emissive color was the uh, uh, glows with the light of its own color. So it's glowing with its own. So I'm going to change this one actually to a uh, diffuse color. So it's not just painting a color on an object. It's actually specifying the type of color characteristic that you want to add to the object. So if I save this guy here, you can see the effect. Before that object, which is a bit shiny, I'm going to open it up here again. See, now it looks more maroon, actually. Because it's not, oh, you can probably can't even see it on your screen, but it's kind of dark. So, actually, here, I'll change this to a blue color. God, let's see. I'll go back to my color combinations. And uh, I like blue. Yeah, I could take, say, I'm going to change it to teal. So I got 0 0.5 and 0.5, 0 0.5 and 0.5. So let's do that. Zero point five point five. So we can kind of see that there's nothing, there's no shininess or uh, diffusion at all going on with it. That is completely. So that's a teal one. You can see that there's hardly very much shininess to the object. So I'm going to add some shininess to it. We'll compare. I'm going to leave that one open for a second. And then here on the shininess, it's kind of like the transparency. I'm going to put it underneath, actually. You know what? I'll just take the transparency out, actually. Let's just do this here and go uh, shininess. And the number has between 0 and 1. So I'm going to go 1.5. No, 1, 0, 0. 0. 0.5. 0. 0.5. Add some shininess to it. Let's see if we notice any difference. I don't know if you're going to be able to see it on the projector, but uh, if you're doing it on your computer, you can certainly see it. So I can sort of see it if I compare the two. One of them is shinier, but you can't see it probably on the projector. <laughs> if this was a silver color, it would look more shinier, I think, because of the blue color. It's not looking that shiny. But uh, I definitely, when I compare the two images, I'm sort of seeing a little bit, but uh, it's hard to see it, however. So. And then the um, other ones that we can look at, um, in fact, one of them is, is not uh, uh, the ambient intensity. Mm, okay, so we, we pretty much exhausted all of those different options in terms of the appearance that we can put on there. There's other as well. This is just a this is just a, the, the defaults that normally people set in terms of the texture and the color. So looking at the texture, pixel texture, defining your own textures via the RGB or the gray, gray scale. So here's an example, and I put this one out there. I called it brick wall. Uh, so brick wall demonstrates the use of textures, and you need the uh, the texture for it. So what I'm going to do is um, copy these out here, actually. I'm going to do one before and one after. So. If I take my brick wall, a CG brick wall, and put it out here, and copy this guy out here. Oops, I can't copy. Okay, so I'll take it from the website. Oh no, I can copy it. That's interesting. There we go. 
So these examples, by the way, are the ones I pointed out originally on the bhacker.com website. They're right here. This one we're looking at, you need both. You need the brick, which is going to be the image file, and you're also going to need the brick wall texture map, which is that example that I just showed you a few minutes ago that I'm going to look at right now, actually. So I'm going to close this one and uh, open up this one for you so you can sort of see what the example looks like. I'm open up the text wrangler. It looks like I have to change the uh, the text display again. So let's just put it on 36. Ah, perfect. A little bigger. So in this particular case, uh, we've actually used a comment on it. So up here you see this hash line up here. This is the name of the file. If you want to put your name on the file, here's, here's another comment that says demonstrate the use of textures. We didn't give this shape a name. Instead of just called it a shape, created the first node. And we gave the appearance as a definition, the texture appearance. So we can define anything we want. We can, we can define the appearance. We can define the, uh, at the, the shape itself if we want to reuse it. So here we have the, the texture. It's going to be image texture, uh, which is going to be uh, the name of the texture. The URL that we're going to use for this is going to be this file right here. But I'm going to throw this file away right now so I don't have the file. And if I run it without the file, let me just show you what happens without the file. It just doesn't load it. Wait a minute. Test 1. Wait a minute. I don't want test 1. Hold on. Let me throw test 1 away too. Or actually, I'll just leave it down here. Uh, let's see. I'm going to open this one, the right one, with the instant player. And this is, this is a brick wall, but there's no image, because I just threw the image away. <laughs> Which means it's not putting the image on the brick. In fact, the brick's just white. If I take the image out of the trash, and I restore it, so I put it back. There we go. So the image is now back out here. And now I load it again. This is the common problem is, here, now, now the brick wall is on the image and it's texture mapped on the whole thing. So texture mapping takes the image and puts it on top of the uh, on top of the object itself. So here we have um, the URL, which is could be anywhere. It could be on the internet. It can be. Um, and, and I didn't specify a directory location, so it's picking it up from the same. And then this is the name I gave it. If you change the name of the file, obviously change it. Uh, change it in here. This is just comment saying this is the end of the texture, this is the end of the appearance. So in the appearance we define the texture and it's going to be so we can we can use this later if we wanted to to redefine without having to redefine we have the texture and we know it's this brick wall thing so we can kind of reuse this further down which is why we defined it but we're not really reusing it. Instead now we have a box and the box is sides one, two, and three and so if I, you know, change the size of the box, maybe make it three, two, one. It's going to be an interesting looking box. And then run it again. There it is. So the box shape changed, but the image map didn't change. So this is kind of a bigger box. It's a three, two, three, and this is a narrower box. So, but the image just wraps around the box on the geometry. So I have another example of a car, actually, that uh, I showed you a couple weeks ago. That, uh, let me drag out here because this seems to be running a little bit better. Um, text car. Texture mapped car. Open with instant messaging. Let me make this bigger because the image is so big. There we go, scale it down this way a little bit. So I've taken the same brick and I've put it, and you can, you can kind of see how this is more transparent. You can see through the window and you can see the other side of the window here, which is a better, I mean, rather than looking at a transparent box where you're just going to see through the box, you're going to see the other side of the box. <laughs> it doesn't really demonstrate the transparency part. 
And I've only taken the tra texture map and I've applied it to the top of the car, to the hood, and to the back of the car. And the rest of it's colored as the car's supposed to be. And we've got some uh, some cones or cylinders actually, and some squares. This is just basically boxes and squares. So if I take a look at this code here, which is really just demonstrating the same concept over again. This one here is actually given for you out on the website as well. And let me make this one a little bit bigger so we can see this one as well. There we go. There we go, that's pretty big. More comments on the top based on this lab car. This is the guy who made it actually, Andy Harris, originally. So the transform is using a scale of a 0 0.8, 0 0.8, 0 0.8. And then what we have now is a bunch of images that are put together. This one is probably a more advanced example. But I wanted to show you the image texture mapping, which is the same concept. So we have the main body. And this is why we want to put comments in here. So on the transform, the transform is the big car. It's the image. So we're placing it in this particular orientation to start out with. Transform contains a child. The child is going to be the main body top painted first. And we have a translation to set its orientation in the scene. And the child of that top is going to be a shape. And the shape is going to have a blue appearance to it. And the uh, we have a material we have a diffuse color zero zero one it's going to give us the blue kind uh, of blue appearance and we're calling this one define blue and then we're going to we end this material then we have another one it's going to be a textured so it's going to be an image texture so if I take this out as an example or actually just change this so it's the wrong file we see now we're going to have the top is going to be a different it's going to be blue actually so where's my actually we don't need the boxes anymore. Now this is the top of the car that was texture mapped before, now it's blue. So now we just have the roof, the textures on the roof. So. And it is kind of also demonstrating the concept of putting all this together in a hierarchy. It's all in the same transform and the transform is actually, I would maybe perhaps modify this because it comes out odd. It comes out straightforward like this, here's your car. And I actually have to move the car <laughs> to sort of see what it is. So you could like come out have it come out like this or something. And then you're gonna change the you're gonna change the transform in the beginning. So let's see, let's take another look here. I'm just gonna play around with this one for a few minutes. So um I'm gonna put this back in because we want the top of the car, the top pieces of the car to have the brick on it. So the geometry is gonna be a 14 by 1 by 14. And so then this is separated out. So I'm going to change this to negative. Yeah, let's say negative one. Negative one. Actually, let's take a look here. So let's see if that's going to be the right direction. Well, no, it's the wrong direction. It held it up this way. <laughs> so I can see the bottom of the car. So I'm going to go positive on it. And this is essentially how you're going to try and, uh, this is interesting, you're going to try and see, well, what is it that I like better? Well, I've, tra I've changed the top of the car, so the top of the car was this piece here that I've changed, and I moved it up by one, which means it was at zero before, and so now I can actually kind of see interesting shadow because I can see the bottom part. I can see the top part through the bottom part actually. This little piece here. But I raised the roof <laughs> essentially. Raised the top. So I'm going to put this back on zero. So, which is how we're getting the the main body top. Which is this main body top. Because if I take out the main body top completely or here, we'll put this, I'll just leave it alone, because now it's it's going to be raised back down to zero. Let me zoom out a little bit so you can sort of see it a little bit better. 
It's kind of like the effect that we're looking at. So how you're going to get the pieces together are going to be the original positioning, and then you're going to position something else in relationship to the new piece that you're putting in. So this one just happens to start out with this main body top, which is one piece, as you can see. It'd be harder to do it into separate pieces because then you'd have to line them up into appropriate locations. And so then we have, uh, let's see, we get past the top, we can look at the body bottom. And this is the bottom, the square here is the bottom. So, in fact, uh, we have a diffused color on the bottom, and then we have a uh, body, uh, main body bottom, and this is the translation for that. So if I just changed it like this, for example, instead of negative two, I made it negative one. I'm going to totally mess this up, actually, let's see. Actually, it's not too bad. It's not bad. I've made the wheels a little bit. You uh, can see the wheels coming out of it a little bit more, I think. It isn't too bad. Compared to this one, well, actually, it's about the same. But I don't see that. I see a slightly different effect here. Actually, I can see a little hole here, actually. This bottom piece is not coming in together. So I'll edit undo typing, put it back on too. <laughs> so, anyway, so we have the same blue appearance that's going on, and then um, applying the roof. And uh, let's see, we can raise the roof. Here, I'll just put five on. So I've raised the roof, literally. The roof's way up there now. So here we'll zoom out a little bit so you can see the roof up here. So if I wanted to build this thing from the scratch, I'd have to figure out what we are. I changed this to five because it came from the center point up. Well, it really wasn't five. I think it was uh, two or something. So that was two. If I change the Z part of it, let's say I make the Z1 as an example, I'm going to make it cockeyed so it's not actually on the same plane. So it won't be straight up and down, actually it'll be angled. So it'll look like this. And I put it back down, but I angled it. So see, now it's kind of off on its Z plane a little bit. <laughs> it's on the right spot, but now it's like, so this is like what I was going to say, unless you're using one of those automated tools that's going to show you the positioning. And then who's going to have a tool that's going to show you a car? So most of the skill in this is trying to troubleshoot and figure out, well, I don't know. Well, so I'm going to have to move that over a little bit. If I move it over a little bit, it'll look more like that. And then I have to lower it down a little bit. So then lower it down. And that's how you make a car. There's nothing more than boxes and different shapes that are all put together with some cones in there. So. Yeah, so let's put this back so we get the car back in position. And sometimes what you can do is also find an example online that's going to show you a similar item. And then you can take that similar item and kind of build from there. If you want. Oh. Cancel whatever it is you're doing. Okay, so at the top it's got the texture map on it and a geometry box. Again, this is all made by boxes, by the way. And the box size is given. And then we have the left panel... Then we have the right body panel. Then we have the nose or the front of the car, um, which is going to essentially be, um, again, another box, actually. And this car front, well, we can always change it, put the other image in here. Uh, what was it called? Brick. So I didn't leave it up there, but now we have a brick. And then we have the tail, the back of the car. Um, Okay, and then so now then we have the shape here of the glass, the window, the windshield area. So it's going to be inclusion. This is going to give us our cross section, which is going to give us our. Um, uh, it's going to be a. Oh, there, there, this looks like the wheels actually. You know, inclusion is the inside of it. So, anyway, there's many different ways of building this. In fact, what you'll be doing is creating a robot that has the same kind of concept to it. So here's a car wheels. Let me change this one. Actually, put the brick in here. Uh, it's actually a JPEG file, so I have to put a JPEG extension on here. 
change this one here. Anyway, I'm just playing around with this to show you what you're going to do in terms of uh, the best way of troubleshooting issues and seeing what the effect's going to be. So let's just save this person here. So now you can see I've added the brick to uh, the front of the car actually has the brick too now. Oops, so if I zoom out a little bit, I can see the front of the car has the brick. This was added, and then the, these guys have the brick here. <laughs> and got the blue bottom, so. Yeah, simple, no animation yet, but simple little car. So, all right, so let me leave that example and continue on to the lecture. Actually, close this guy out. Oops, there you go, what do I got here? Oops, okay, so. So we looked at the texture mapping as a concept, and that was just one image. You can take many different images and put them on different different surfaces to create, um, you know, like a, a floor, a wooden floor, as an example, some walls, some pictures. In fact, you can take little pictures of people and put it on items as well. Um, and here's our. This is where I stopped actually on the, on the image. And if you want to, if you download the, the lecture, if you click on the image, you can actually save that as well. So here's on more on the geometry nodes, as I mentioned before. So they have the box, is what you've been seeing so far, specified with XYZ coordinates. And then we have the cylinder, where we have a radius, a height, the flag is for controlling the rendering of the sides. So the radius, the height, and then the sides. So the top is going to be false, oh, excuse me, false on the cylinder. Um, so if we created one of these here, in fact, if you wanted to see what these guys look like, you could easily, and let me go back to this one here. This isn't going to take too long to type in. Is uh, type some of the shapes in, actually. Here, I'm going to take all this stuff out. And I'm just going to go and... Uh, actually, let me not. I have to retype everything. Let's just do under typing. I believe this one already had a box in here. Yes, it did. Perfect. So then down here, I can go geometry. Uh, cylinder, and then in here, go our radius, point, 0.5, I don't believe you have to put the O in there, um, height, 10, uh, top, false. So I have a single shape in here, let me just make sure that's correct. Go save. And which one is this? Test one. There we go. Oops. Zoom out so you can sort of see this, and then I can move the shape around. So. And so if I say, well, what, is, what does that mean? And I put the top, and I said false. That's what it means. <laughs> There's no top. There's absolutely nothing on the top. So if I go to false, if I leave that out, so you can see how we have one end, that's the bottom, and that's the top. So I can just leave this out or make it true. And now I have one end and two ends. <laughs> So I have both ends. So I can say bottom false, bottom true. So those are like little parameters that you can set or properties you can set on the shapes to, um, I don't know, play around with it to kind of see what effect you're going to get. Um, the sphere here, if I do this one here, and this might be how you're going to create your alien as well. Um, Mm, let's do the cone. I'm going to do the cone underneath, actually. I'm just going to go like this here and go like this. Copy. Paste. Let's see what happens. Um, I'll put a make a big because that cylinder is pretty big. So I'm going to put here a cone. And, uh, on the cone, I'm going to have a bottom radius. Five. This is just an example. 
and a height 10 and a bottom false. Now let's just leave that off. So. Oops, uh, failed to load. Let's cut this one. Hmm, let's see. Uh, the scene destructor. Warning scanner. Hmm. Oh, probably because the way I have this defined, actually. Let's get rid of this one here. Now let's do it. No, I think Instant Player is just not happy. So let's quit out of Instant Player. Edit Undo. So now I put that shape back in. Let me save it again. Instant Player, for some strange reason, crashes on me a lot. I'm not quite sure why. It's going to crash again. Alright, so we're crashing right now. <laughs> so, actually, let me just try something else before I continue. Uh, let's see. Let's take this out. Just test one. Cancel first. Instant player. Okay, yeah, we're not going to play happy. It's going to cancel out on me. So I could actually drag it over and put it on my window side and open it up, but we'll just leave it alone. Actually, let me take one of the cars that used to work. Maybe it's something with the code, actually. Nope, the car's still going to load. So it was probably my code then, actually. It was probably something I was doing. Because the car's still loading. That's the last version of the car. So. Alright, so let me see. Troubleshoot my problem real quick here. I probably had a special character or something in here. Uh, or applying a property that didn't that didn't exist. Oh, here this might be the problem. Here it's bottom, not capital B. Bottom radius height ten. And here I'll put it here bottom false so we can see what that looks like as well. So it appears as I had a typo in there. I had a capital B instead of a lower B. So let's see what happens with this. Now this one's going to work. I'm going to go in, 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 in. But I put them both on top of each other. So I really have a cone. No, actually I didn't. I just put the cone in here. <laughs> I took out the other one, actually, that I had in there earlier. Um, so let's put them both in there. So here we have this shape. And uh, I'm going to copy. I'll put a square in here underneath it. So they're going to overlap because I'm not mentioning any transform on them. So this is going to be a box. So as you just experienced actually with my instant player crashing, it was nothing to do with the instant player. It was the fact that I had a capital B for the geometry here for bottom radius. So you can see the level of the troubleshooting. Not so good for debugging. I mean, all that was because I had a, a it was case sensitive and I had a problem with it. So on my box, I'm going to go size 5.5, 3.75. I'm actually going to specify a size here, 1.0, instead of using the defaults. So now I have a box and I have a cone, I believe, yes, that I'm going to put together. And here we have, we have overlapping box and a cone. So you can see the, let me zoom out a little bit so you can actually see it a little bit. See how the box and the cone are intercepting? So I have the start of a UFO going on right here. <laughs> this is what you're doing. You're creating something like this. 
So you're going to put something out. So this is intercepting. If you want to move and uh, use a transform on it, you can actually move it to a position. And I'm going to show you one to, towards the end here where it's going to have things on top of the box, actually. This is pretty cool. All right. So uh, those are some of the other shape options that we can use. So we have flags for cylinders as well. And you saw that a few minutes ago. I put the flag on the cylinder in here, and I said top is false bottom is false on the cone and on the cylinder. So what are these flags about? So we have top, sides, and bottom. So they're Boolean values of true and false, and they tell the browser whether to display the appropriate section of the cylinder. Why do you want that? Well, maybe you don't want to see the bottom part of it. You want like it to be like one of those blow horns or something. I'd say bottom false, if that were the case. So the defaults, by default, everything is true, which means the entire image is going to be shown. So you don't, you don't put them in. Um, you're going to get the entire shape. So, however, the cylinder at one end it might be obscured by the user's object. It might overlap with something else. So you have the ability to turn it on and off. We also have this thing called prototypes. So, more on the code reuse. So far, our statements have always resulted in rendering images in the VRML viewer, which is what we've been interested in doing, is putting images out there on the screen. So, it's useful to uh, specify graphical procedures that just declare shapes and don't render them. Those are called prototypes. So you declare a bunch of shapes and then render them when you want them to appear. And then you have the ability to show it or not show it. The parameters uh, to these graphical procedures are, can, could become very useful for certain, for certain things. So one way to create a procedure in a VRML is to use a prototype or proto statement, which gives you a prototype. So it creates the shape, just doesn't render it. So remember when we did that box, and we took the box, and we performed a translation on it, and the child, we said, give me that box. Well, it was called F-box or something. Well, we can create prototypes and just use the prototypes without displaying them onto the screen. So we had two of them, and one of them was underneath the other one. Well, if we create the prototype, then it's going to be not showing at all, and then we can use it as a child object and then show it when we want to show it. So we can create some like default shapes and then just reuse these shapes to create a pattern or something, or to do something with it that we want. So the prototype syntax looks like this. You use proto, the name of the prototype, and then the parameter description with the syntax and the fields and the parameters and some graphical description as well. We have SF boolean. This is a single boolean value where we can have a true or a false. Um, these are just some of the parameters that we can set. FS image, float. Um, I'm not going to bore you with the prototype stuff, but here's an example of one that's called uh, for graphing an axis, an axis, the axis, the that's called the graph axis, and this is one of the examples that I put out here on the bhacker.com website. One of these here. So, if I take a look at it, uh, actually, let me just do this real quick because I'm saving this out here. Uh, so I'm going to put this one on the desktop. So here we have example number one. I'll show you what these examples look like because you're probably going to want to play around with the examples for the most part, which is a good way of learning this particular concept. So two. Well, actually, I clicked on it. So this is one of our prototypes. Let me get to it in a second, though. Where we see this is the one that has the accesses on it, uh, but I also have some points that are defined on here. So we can sort of see the XYZ coordinates and move it around. But I didn't mean to actually open it. I wanted to save it. So let's see. There we go. Save it. Okay, I know. I'm going to fail to load. I know. Just stop loading. <laughs> and I'm so my browser is trying to load it. That's what the problem is. Okay. That's the last one. Let's see. There we go. Okay, so if I take a look at these things I've just downloaded, I should hopefully... S no, I don't see them out here. Okay, well, they're probably in my downloads directory. But if you download all those the things that we just looked at a few minutes ago, this is number one, actually which is the first one in the lecture set. So all of the things I've been demonstrating to you are in those downloaded files, <laughs> so, which is what I'm trying to tell you. Uh, 
There's one in particular, one is the last one. So let me go to that last one and download that one again. Number five. Save file. Well, it's putting, oh, it's putting in my downloads directory. Okay, so hold on one second, let me just find this. Here they are. So I'll just leave this window up over here. Okay, so in terms of the prototypes, what we're looking at is defining a shape here, and the size is going to be is dimensions is going to be a keyword is the syntax that you, that's used primarily used with is syntax. So it defines a graphical procedure or a prototype called a graphic access, and the procedure has formal uh, parameters called dimensions that are that are inside of here, and we can change them programmatically. So once we create the prototypes, we use the prototypes to change them. At this particular stage in your VRML development, you're probably not going to create any new prototypes right now. You'd be lucky to create shapes and get the shapes to line up correctly. But as a problem scenario, is define a prototype for a plot of points with parameters and color positions. Well, that was the one we just saw a few minutes ago. And that example, actually, I believe is number three here. Uh, let's take a look here. I believe it's this one right here. Here's a, the code is here that goes along with it and it's not going to make any sense to you until you actually kind of see what, what was the finished result. These are a bunch of points. Well, they're really spheres. And then we have um, the, the rectangle boxes. These are boxes, by the way, that are really thin that are put around the X and Y and Z axis. So we've got um, all three of the dimensions portrayed. And so we can see all the coordinates and then we're sticking these in one of the coordinates actually of the plane. Actually, it looks like it's hitting the zero axis too. So, just helps you kind of put things into perspective. Uh, but that's one, that's example number three. The first two are from the lecture part that we looked at already. The first one I showed you a few minutes ago. Second one doesn't want to load, which is fine. It doesn't have to. We've already seen it actually. So, so navigation. We can also add navigation, was navigation, a link to our particular site. So suppose we want to work in the, as an HTML. This is being loaded, by the way, the web browser loads these VRMLs through the plugin, just like putting an audio file or a video file out there. You're um, loading it up, it's showing up, and it's embedded in your HTML code. But what if when the user clicks on a particular part of your VRML image in terms of your world? it goes to a URL. So in this particular example here, we're creating an anchor. And then the anchor is a child, so it's going to use the head. This is going to be the head portion of the browser. So it's going to go out and say, in the head. Well, what we're going to do, essentially, is tell the browser to go to this URL. And so we have a description here. It's going to be back to the ITU homepage. And then we're going to have a URL that's going to be go to itu.edu. And we're going to use that in there. So the rest of this is practicing, actually making a spaceship, making a house, making something that is unique in terms of the concept. Um, I'm going to close this window because it makes it run a little bit too slow. But um, So I'm going to cancel this here for a second. Let me just minimize this here. I'm going to open up the house expression, or the, excuse me, the last example, which is number five, I believe, and take a look at this one. So talk about your spaceships. This is actually kind of like a birthday cake or something. Uh, we can put an image map, and I'll put an image map on here actually to show you what I'm talking about. I still have my image out here. Um, so I put words ITU world on the side, one side of it. You can kind of see I have a bottom. We have little cones here that are duplicated on the sides. A little cylinder with a round ball. That well, looks like a spaceship. Actually, it kind of looks like a birthday cake for the most part. So let's take a look at the pieces of this. So if I open this up in Text Wrangler, I can see where this version, let me make this a little bit bigger. Make it 36. Here we go. Looks pretty good. Actually, let me come out here and close this down. This will make the computer run a lot faster. Okay, so we have the shape here. Um, the initial shape, this is that birthday cake thing that you just looked at. We have a cylinder, that's the main cylinder. 
here's the shame. This is all a combination of everything in that lecture you just looked at. So this is a bunch of, there's nothing fancy either. Not as hard as the car. So we've got the uh, original cylinder that comes down the middle. It's this guy right here. And he's using a diffused color. So you can see it's kind of see-through. You can see the red cone. I don't know if you can see it on the video. Yeah, you can. You can see the red cone through it. So it's diffused. And it's a uh, transparency is set on that so you can see through it. Um, and that's the cylinder. And the bottom is false. Well, the bottom is false because we don't want to see it. If we put the bottom true, we'll see a darker. A darker. Actually, that's a good question. Would we see a darker? Let's see. True. And let's go save. Where's my downloaded files? Actually, here, we'll just do this one here. Nope. Open with. Instance. No effect, really, actually. I didn't see an effect on this at all. Okay, so I guess it's probably intersecting with the bottom piece, so it's going to be white anyway. So no real effect on that. Uh, so we probably could just leave it out. And then here we have a brick. Well, we don't have brick image, so I'm going to change this one here because I changed the name of the image to CG brick. So I'm going to put this brick that's out here uh, in here. And this is going to be on the, uh, I believe it's going to be on the round part on the top. But let's just take a look here. No, it's going to be on the box. So let's take a look here. Repeat S, repeat true, repeat T. So let me, let me just see where the brick appears here. Save. Let's see. Now, I have a strange feeling I'm opening up the wrong file. Let me just save this to the desktop. <laughs> Which is probably why I didn't see anything on the other one. So let's put this guy on the desktop. There we go. And I call it example five. There we go. Aha! Uh -huh. There we go. <laughs> now we're talking. So I put the brick on there, and uh, I still don't see an effect with the top. I do see an effect with the top. So I see the green that's on the top here, and I believe it was the top that we made. Uh, let's see. Oh, it was the bottom. Let's make this false and see what happens. bottom. Mm. Well, I'm not seeing very much of an effect there. But I do see the ball, and if I click on this ball right here, see where it says ITU homepage on the bottom? just showed up a few seconds ago. Let's see if you look down here on the bottom of the screen. That's where the hyperlink is, and so if I press that, I get the ITU homepage is going to come up in my web browser. So that's a demonstration of the hyperlink, actually. Yeah, oh, it does come up. That's good. So... So we can put links all over the place, and we click on it, and it opens up stuff if we want to. Um, then here I've got uh, the image that I stuck on here. So I've got the image here that looks like it's on the bottom piece, geometry box, which is this piece down here. If I mess around with the geometry of this box, maybe change one of the sides here, I'm going to notice it's not going to line up correctly. So this is what it's supposed to look like. This is what it looks like now. So you can kind of see I changed this to 3 instead of 4, which was the width of the item. So now I see, oh, it's kind of, kind of small. Now the little pieces don't sit on the top of it. <laughs> so that's what you're going to have to do in order to play around with it. So I can make it even bigger and just, you know, or take it, put it back to 4. And then on the appearance here, I have the Eichel cones. Set the bottom to false because we don't want to see the cone down here. Well, you're not going to see it anyway. So, some of the stuff, if we were able to see through it, if we set the bottom to false, um, we might be able to see through it, make it hollow. So, now let's go down to where we've got the text that's coming in here. And the text, 
let's see, it's right here. So we have a description um, on the geometry text. So we created a new object and we put the string here, IT world, and we created a font size of eight and put it in the middle of here. And this is part of the bottom child node of the box. So we kind of made a text object node and put it on top of it, which is where that's coming from. So you can add text, you can add images, you can add different shapes, put them on top of different shapes. The key with this thing is we're using a transform on it, so we're translating the objects. In fact, this is one of the objects for the sphere. Uh, the sphere is probably going to be the top object here, so we can maybe make this take out the two and we'll see what happens here. So it's not well documented. So I'm not quite sure what part, but I have a strange feeling I changed the top piece. I did. I moved it down. Oops. So I moved that down. <laughs> Which is kind of an interesting effect, actually. <laughs> so I moved this down instead of two. So actually, if I want it, you know, uh, I don't like the point file. I'm going to put it right here. So then I'm going to raise it. So let's see. I didn't like that effect, so I'm gonna. I'm lowering it a little bit because I want it on top. There we go. So now I can sort of see it's more on top, more flush at the top. This one was 0.25 above it, a little bit. So you can see the bottom of it. This one is more like on top of it, so it's overlapping. So that's how you're gonna line things up, actually. So you may also use this example as a starting point for your spaceship. So your spaceship can be a variation of this as well. Well, this was the fun stuff for today. I actually kind of ended a little bit early, um, which isn't too bad. So I'll leave you some time to play around with this stuff. Do we have any questions? I mean, that's a good spot to start with. I could start in and start in with the next lecture if you want. Or I can let you guys go a little bit early today. Your choice. Let's go early. <laughs> next time we'll do the boring lecture. So I'm going to stick around so you can uh, start playing with it and I can try start help you troubleshoot some problems. If you, uh, you want to do your homework assignments now, that's not a bad idea as well. So I'll give you a little bit of class time um, where I can help you as well. So. Okay, that is all for today. Unless you have questions. I see a computer coming this way. <laughs> Good.